Welcome back to Dr. Pronghorn's Make Along Vlog. Today I'm going to tell you how I resurrected this 1977 Jeep CJ5 Renegade, the AMC V8. It took me 10 weeks to do it, uh, but I got it running again after it had been sitting for 14 years in one spot. So here it is. Uh, when I first saw it in the summer of 2021, it belonged to the mother of a friend of mine, and she unfortunately passed away, but I was able to uh, get a, an offer in on it and purchase it from her estate. And... Uh, uh, it was in pretty bad shape. It had gotten a lot of uh, animals living in it over time. You'd see that it was uh, covered with tarps to keep uh, water out, but uh, still had a little bit of water damage. Not too bad. The frame was uh, strong and there was not a lot of body rust, just some rust in the floor pan. So here we are cleaning it off, getting it uh, good enough just to be able to move it. Then we're going to try to push it out of its spot. It's been sitting here for 14 years, so the dirt had actually built up a little bit around it. We had to dig it out. And uh, yeah, see, I was trying to just steer it, but in the end, everybody had to be outside pushing to get it to move. And and there it is, rolling for the first time in more than a decade, uh, getting it going again. And then we uh, we had to pull it onto a trailer. So what we did was we actually hooked it to a tow strap um, and pulled the truck forward to pull it up onto the trailer. We had blocks to keep the trailer from moving. We were able to get it in place that way, a little bit of celebration, and uh, and then keep it moving. So here it is back in a secure, undisclosed location where I was able to work on it. And you can see there's a lot of material stuck in the front window where you fold it down, had the original spare tire on it. Uh, there was a locking lug nut I had to get off, had to figure out how to get that off without the key. First uh, job I did was pull the seats out and then fix the rust that had been on the bottom of the seats, give the seats a complete cleaning. I also pulled the spare tire carrier off, gave it a cleaning, put it in the um, in the Evapo rust and then painted it with uh, Pour 15. You can see here it is with the seats out, a lot of uh, you know rat leavings to clean up out of the inside. In pretty good shape. I was a suspicious. I was suspicious at the beginning that the problem was the distributor because of some of the parts that uh, I found in the Jeep with some receipts from back in the day. And so uh, I pulled the, uh, you'll see what I do to replace that. But here I pulled the spark plugs out, filled the cylinders with uh, Marvel mystery oil to let it soak in and, and get them freed up before I moved them. There was rust in the valve cover, so I had to replace those. Uh, here the seat is repainted and back in place. I think it looks really good. So that was the first thing that I really accomplished was getting that driver's seat back into place uh, so I could, <laughs> I could pretend to drive. I could sit in it and pretend to drive it. Here are the valves. So the valves themselves actually looked like they were in pretty good shape. There was some rust falling off of the inside of the valve covers. So I blew them off with compressed air. Summer oil filter, use a screwdriver. Here you see the engine starting. It's uh, not actually trying to start it, just turning it over. To look for oil pressure. And also to, uh, to test to just clear out those cylinders. Here I am hammering a socket onto that uh, blocking lug nut to get it off. And then the most expensive job of it all was actually replacing all five tires. The four tires that were on the ground were actually still looked great, but they were so old it wasn't safe to drive on them. Um, there's plenty of great videos on YouTube of old tires exploding. So here they are going into my Subaru to take them to the tire store. The tire store guys were amazed by that spare. There's the spare. It was, I think, an actual original 1977 tire, never replaced. But the other tires were from the uh, late 2000, 2000s and uh, would not be safe to drive on. I also went through and replaced every rubber part in the braking system just before I ever drove it because it's important to have a truck that stops and won't go. It, it, you don't want a truck that'll go and won't stop. <laughs> so here I am taking apart the front calipers. Um, I'm going to replace those hoses with new uh, rated steel hoses. There I am popping the um, piston out with compressed air. That's how you do it. To pop the piston out with compressed air, then clean everything up with brake cleaner, and then replace the rubber gaskets inside, which I don't show here, but it's actually very difficult to get those gaskets back on. I think it ended up taking me about an hour on each of the calipers to get the gaskets um, this seal. So here are the new tires, getting them all out of the car and back onto the Jeep. I don't put all, I didn't put all the lug nuts on because I was still having to take everything apart. I have to use all of my extensions to bolt this back seat back in because there's no tailgate on this Jeep. 
yeah, that was a that was a little bit of a process to get that seat in. I'm probably going to pull it anyway because I don't think anybody's going to ride in the back seat. Here I am getting that spare tire back on again. I cleaned up the spare tire carrier, so no no worries about rust there anymore. Here we are. All the seats are in. New tires. Yeah, the tires were the most expensive. It was about two hundred dollars per tire mounted, so that's a thousand dollars for five tires. Slowly getting through the list. And when I put spark plugs into an engine, I always put anti-seize on the spark plugs because I really don't want to have spark plugs stick in the cylinder head or tear the threads out. That's just a, a real nightmare. So a little word of the wise. I always put that anti-seize on there. And then I replaced the distributor. I didn't want to deal with the old 1977 solid state uh, electronics. So I bought a new um, HEI style distributor to replace it with. I bought it from Summit Racing. And um, all it slotted right in, it ended up being a, a problem that I put the distributor in without putting any assembly lube. I'm, I'm gonna spoil everything here. I didn't put any assembly lube on the distributor gear, and I should have, because I turned it over a ton of times before I had oil pressure trying to get the timing right. And as I did it, I actually tore up the, the distributor gear. There it is starting for the first time. Finally got everything to work right, got the I didn't show you the hour of, of uh, tweaking the timing to get that startup to happen. Anyway, so when you put those distributors in, make sure you put assembly lube on them. Here I am um, putting a little bit of uh, grease onto the little sliding pin just to make it get slot in there easier. And it's got a, a little lock screw, so it's not going anywhere. Yeah, like I said, I didn't show you the hour it took me to get all the rubber gaskets back onto the front brakes. It's not technically complicated, it's just difficult. You have to hold like three things in place at the same time. Now, the drums were held in place by three Phillips head screws, which I understand are only there because they were um, used on the assembly line to keep the drums from falling off as the Jeeps were moving along. And then finally I got the first one to move. It was a, a pain. <laughs> So I used a lot of fire, I also used ice, so you'll see me heating it up with the map torch and then coming back and hitting it with the upside down compressed air, which you know it says on the can not to turn it upside down, but the reason why is because it shoots out basically liquid nitrogen when you do that. So the contrast heat and cold was enough to eventually get those screws to free up. And uh, all the stuff I read online says that you don't have to put those screws back when you put everything back together, but I went ahead and did it. But I put a lot of anti-seize on them too, so hopefully the next time somebody pulls these drums off, they won't have that problem. Once the screws are off, you have to actually um, go on under and back off the brake shoes to get the drum to come off, which is what I was doing there with the screwdriver. And then I'm not going to show you the process of pulling the brakes apart and putting the new uh, wheel cylinder in, uh, especially not on this side because I didn't use my brake pliers. I have some drum brake pliers and I had not bothered to do a little refresher course on YouTube on how to use the drum brake pliers. So I did it completely wrong on this side. And it took me like uh, an hour, maybe almost two hours to get all the springs off and back on again. And uh, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, so I show a little bit of it on the other side, but in the end, I actually have so much footage on the brakes. I could probably do a separate video that's just on those uh, rear brakes. So here you go. The, the pliers actually have a special tool for getting those, those stop springs off. And then you can use the, the pliers part to get this bottom spring off. And it turns out there's another end of the pliers that you can use to get those top springs back on very easily. And then I, I discovered I still had my toolbox, but I forgot to use it, a, a tool to get those um, mounting springs off that uh, hold the shoes in place. So here I am putting the new uh, wheel cylinder in, all new wheel cylinders in the back, as well as uh, new brake lines. So there shouldn't be any problems with the brakes. I also did a new master cylinder, I'll show that in a minute. So here you see the the back end of the pliers, one side takes those springs off and the other side pops them back on. It's super fast and easy. Unfortunately, this one you have to use the pliers to get on. And it took me, I don't know, it felt like an hour, maybe more like 15 or 20 minutes, but there were a lot of mistakes Mistakes were made as I was trying to get the that bonnet spring back on. Obviously, it went back together. Here I am getting that front wheel, the front right wheel. I didn't show the process of doing that whole front right 
Break caliber, trust me, I did that one too. And so here, here we're going to uh, bench bleed the master cylinder. The master cylinder, um, every time you get a new master cylinder, it's dry and you have to fill it all completely up with brake fluid so there's no spaces for bubbles because that, that makes the pedal not work right. And then you end up with, uh, you know, um, spongy brakes and not stopping right. So you have to fill it with uh, fluid and then on the bench you have to uh, press the piston in until you can get all the bubbles out, re-keeping them and refilling it with fluid. And so I did that eventually. Now to get the old master cylinder off, one of the compression fittings was was rusted on too much, so I had to use a little bit of heat to persuade it to come off. Uh, so I get both of these uh, hydraulic fittings loose. And then it turns out that the engineers at Jeep actually set it up so that the bolts that hold it onto the firewall are, have actual nuts, separate loose nuts on the inside. So fortunately I'm shaped like a gorilla and I can reach around and hold the nut on one side and the bolt on the other side, but it's kind of a hassle. And in the end, what I ended up doing was putting the vice grips onto the nut so that it would stay fixed in one place while I was um, ratcheting on the side and the firewall side, you can see. So once I get the master cylinder kind of in place, I use the hydraulic fittings on the uh, brake lines to hold it in place temporarily so that I can get the nuts and bolts set up to attach it to the firewall. Probably not what you're supposed to do, but I didn't have, you know, eight arms. Not an octopus. I'm an ape. So here I go, pushing that nut through, and then I reach around into the front of the Jeep, and I can actually thread the nut onto the uh, bolt. Then I put the vice grips on it, and I'm able to get it all the way down and torque it, get the torque setting correct. Continuing to knock things off of the to-do list. One of the tools was to get the brake lights to work. Now the brake lights work. Turned out that the um, switch had come loose and I just had to go in and tighten the switch down. Now here what I'm doing is trying to get the timing exactly right because I could only get it to run for about 30 seconds uh, at a time. And I, I realized the reason why was because the timing was just a little bit off. So I did a bunch of tweaking to get the timing exactly where I wanted it to. And then here you see I'm start, I'm turning it over and over and then tweaking the timing and turning it over and over. What I don't realize is I'm tearing up those gears inside the engine at the same time. I should have put a bunch of grease assembly lube onto the distributor, but here it goes. Finally got it to run. And it sounds so strong too. That was a pretty major accomplishment, getting it to this point. And consider what had happened. This is his first trip out, went to go get gas. Um, the lady who had it before me had actually replaced the gas tank and a bunch of the fuel lines. So there wasn't a lot of gas in it either. So what I did was I didn't bother to clean the fuel tank out. I just put a bunch of fresh high, high octane gas into it and uh, a couple of fuel filters in line to protect the carburetor. It sounds so great. Yep, and so I took it to Cars and Coffee in June after I got it running. Everybody was really impressed. I drove it in the rain to Cars and Coffee with no top on. And uh, and it made it all the way to Cresswell from Eugene, but then on the way back, it backfired really hard and wouldn't run anymore, so I had to get towed back to the garage. That's what's happening here. And uh, what I thought was wrong at first was that I had never rebuilt the, dis the carburetor in, the, in this whole process, so I thought it was a carburetor problem. So I went ahead and got a rebuild kit and I rebuilt the whole carburetor. I'm going to show an abbreviated version here. Again, I have so much video on this, I could probably do an entire carburetor video. Um, but basically the process of rebuilding a carburetor isn't, isn't that complicated. You just take everything apart and then clean it all and then um, replace the pieces that you get in the carburetor kit uh, with new ones. So here I, I have a big bucket of uh, carburetor cleaner I use for some of the parts and then the main body of it I couldn't fit into that so I put it into the sonic cleaner I use for watches. Add a little simple green and filled it up with water and then I just ran it uh, through about three cycles until it felt like it was coming clean and there wasn't any more dirt coming out of it. There it goes. This is super accelerated high speed and so I also uh, had a broken side marker light, so I went ahead and super glued it together while I was letting the carburetor clean. Now I'm putting it, reassembling, I use a little bit of 3-in-1 oil on the 
the shaft here for the butterfly valves. Have to get them lined up so they actually close all the way properly when you've got them in there and then carefully screw these screws back in. If you strip those, it's a hassle to replace them. And then here I'm, I'm, I'm assembling the accelerator pump. So there's a little diaphragm you have to get into the body of the carburetor, pull it through, and then you can cut off the little piece that was there just to pull it through. And then I, I almost assembled it without the spring. I forgot there's actually got to be a spring inside here. So I start to put it together, but then I remembered. So I got the spring out. A little bit of hassle to hold everything together with the spring, but you need to have that spring for it to work correctly. I am glad I went ahead and did the carburetor rebuild, even though that wasn't the fundamental problem because the accelerator pump had completely degraded um, and was obviously not working correctly. So I think it was going to lead to a lot more uh, problems in the future if I hadn't rebuilt the carburetor. Here I, I realized I hadn't pulled these um, annuli out. They needed to get also cleaned separately and then a new gasket put in where they fit into the carburetor body. And here I am reassembling the carburetor float. So this is the float that regulates how much fuel stays inside the carburetor. Carburetor has a little bitty gas tank in it that it sucks the gas out of to then spray into the intake. Carburetors are really cool devices. You got to realize they're actually mechanical computers. They're essentially a mechanical computer to meter gasoline. It does the same thing as fuel injection, but with no electronics. Now the kit didn't come with a replacement gasket to go between this uh, spacer block and the intake manifold. So I had to buy some gasket material and then make my own gasket. You can see me using a little bit of water there to mark out where the holes need to be in the corners. And then I'm just basically mocking up what the gasket would have looked like. The original gasket got pretty torn up when I pulled it off the engine, so I couldn't just copy it. There it goes on. Then you get this insulator block, and then there's actually another insulator, and then the carburetor goes on top. You can see the automatic choke on the side close to you. So there's a heater hose that runs right by it that helps it to warm up. Um, and then see that big pop out the top? That's what told me that their problem was not just the carburetor. There was something more fundamentally wrong. And uh, I'll tell this is a little clip that shows you what I thought was going on, and I'll tell you what really happened. Well, I rebuilt the carburetor, and it's all clean and beautiful now, and it seems to be holding fuel just fine. But when I tried to restart the engine, it continued to backfire, and so I went to check the timing next. And what became clear was that the engine has jumped the timing uh, by like 90 degrees. And so I'm going to have to take all the front off to replace the timing chain and timing gears. And then I have to pull the valve train apart and see if it has wrecked all the valves and push rods and rocker arms. So it'll be an excuse to do a lot more work on the inside of the engine, but not going to space anymore. Uh, this is the end of my Jeep adventure for now. So stay tuned, we'll do what we can do. Yeah, and so here's my list of things that I needed to look at when I pulled the front of the engine apart. And I've done all those now. I'm gonna do a second video showing that process. But suffice to say, I didn't actually jump the timing chain for the engine, it was actually the distributor gear that was trued up. And so I didn't end up having to deal with the valve train. Everything there was still in good shape. Um, so I got all that footage. I'm going to put it together and put that video together for you too, but this is already like uh, 18 minutes long, almost 19 minutes long. So I wanted to just wrap it up here. So b believe me, the Jeep runs again. You can see a short where I show you it restart again. And at this point I put about 80 miles on it, no more problems. But um, yeah, this is how far I got it to in, in June. So the first 10 weeks of having the Jeep, I got it from not running at all to uh, running and driving and then not running anymore because I, I didn't put any lube on that distributor when I put it together. So let that be the lesson here that you need to actually put assembly lube on any gears that are gonna run when it's starting up from sitting for a long time. Uh, thanks for listening, uh, for watching and uh, listening. And uh, you know, let me know if you got any reactions to this video, give me a comment, give me a like if you enjoyed it. And of course subscribe so you can see the second part which should be coming up very soon. Um, thank you very much, bye.